Hello, and uh, welcome to another video on Battles of the American Revolution. This one's going to be a little different. This one's going to be probably uh, more along the lines of an after-action report, just because of um, what happened when I was trying to do this. So, first of all, this is Brandywine. The Battle of Brandywine comes in the Battles of the American Revolution tri-pack. And uh, I played this face-to-face -face a couple of weeks ago with a friend, and it was both of our uh, first times playing this particular game. I had never played Brandywine before. He had actually never played the system before. So he was learning uh, the rules as well, and we figured, hey, let's try the Battle of Brandywine. It seemed fun because we had both never done it. Now, uh, the Battle of Brandywine obviously uh, is... Uh, one of the larger uh, scenarios of this particular uh, system. And um, I tried to take video of it as we were playing, um, but it, uh, the, the, the location that we were in was extremely noisy. Um, and therefore, um, I couldn't get a good um, audio quality and I didn't want to put a video up like that. I did, however, manage to uh, take a bunch of photos um, so I figured I would do this video. It's just kind of a, a after action report of looking back at what was going on. Um, and hopefully you enjoy this. Um, you know, at least it's something, right? So uh, Battle of Brandywine, uh, as you can see here, this is sort of the starting positions of the game, sort of the first turn. The British essentially have the choice of bringing their units on at one of two locations. I decided to sort of split them into two uh, columns, essentially. Off to the right, you had Knipphausen with uh, the majority of the British units that start the game to assault Maxwell on, on that hill there. Uh, and the Americans, by the way, are sort of confined to this operational area, uh, sort of on the other side of the river, and they're not allowed to deviate either left or right too far. So they start in sort of a defensive line there, um, waiting for the British to attack. Over in the left, you can see that uh, Gray and Grant have taken the British up that road. Um, getting across the river is pretty tough unless there's a ford. Um, you can cross without it, but there's a lot of American guns on those ridges, and uh, you'd be taking artillery fire um, during a really slow process. So I decided to split uh, off to the left there. You can see Grant um, and try and have him cross further upstream or downstream. Not quite sure which direction the river flows um, and sort of flank um, Sullivan's force there. And by the way, Sullivan's force is sort of locked in place in that particular location. They're not allowed to move for a couple of turns. Um, so uh, that's sort of the state of things um, in turn one and the way the game starts. And here's a closer look. You can see there's Grant trying to cross that river. Uh, Gray moving his uh, units into position. He felt that he might try and cross up there at the top between those two uh, American batteries um, because there's no defenses. Um, and he has his own uh, batteries as well. So if he could win that artillery duel, he'd be able to get units across. And then over here on the right, you can see that the Queen's Rangers and some Loyalist Tories, along with the King's Own Regiment, which is a really powerful unit early in the game, they tried to make an attack up this hill and uh, didn't go so well the first time, but they uh, you know, were, were attempting to push Maxwell off and force him back across the river so they could clear the way for the reinforcements that would be coming up from the, uh, behind them. Here, you can see uh, that process happening. You've got the Queen's Rangers and the Queen's Light Dragoons uh, about to attack up that hill. Uh, along with the king's own against um, those who is that? That's uh, Porterfield and Lady Washington's horse, and um, you know that attack uh, at first did not go well, but they had a couple of bites at the apple, and eventually the Americans were driven off. <clears throat> here is actually the result of uh, what happened here with an attack from Knipphausen, I believe, on a following turn. Um, this was a, a turn flank, refuse flank. Um, the Americans decided they were going to try and counterattack down the hill uh, by trying to turn the flank of Knipphausen's force, and the British saw it coming all the way. So it was a pretty disastrous attack, and I believe Maxwell himself was killed uh, in this particular exchange, um, which was a huge uh, morale penalty to the Americans and a huge boost for the British who uh, would mop up there quite uh, quite quickly after that. And here's a look at what the uh, sort of situation looked like after Maxwell was killed. You can see that the Hessians had come up the road there behind uh, Knipphausen and had started to make a move for uh, that f Chad's Ford there along the river. The Americans here were in a really dangerous spot. Um, if you're forced to retreat up against the creek and you can't go the whole direction, you're just completely eliminated. Um, so the, the Americans were trying to figure out how to get those units there, one, that one in the forest and that artillery unit there on top of the hill, um, out of the there before the Hessians could surround them and the British could bring up more units. Over on the left, you can see the first effects of the uh, American battery fire dis, uh, disrupting uh, a British unit um, while Gray tries to get some of his infantry across the river uh, before they are shelled to death. Here's a different look at it here where you can see uh, Grant over on the left. He successfully made his crossing and he was going to flank around to the other side. I think it was a good strategy. It gave the American something uh, player to something to think about. Um, and it was re just really generally annoying um, for Sullivan's units who couldn't quite uh, decide where they wanted to commit while this was going on. 
Um, here is uh, those reinforcements I talked about from the uh, the British. Knipphausen decided that he was going to go off over here to the right uh, of this picture and try and pick off some of these small American units to force an uncontested crossing, which would allow him to come and kind of uh, flank around the other side. I was essentially trying to put the Americans limited movement, um, as a liability, um, while I sort of left some of my bigger units, um, as a threat to cross the, the Fords if, if the Americans move to contest it. So it was a lot of, uh, whack-a-mole, the American players trying to play there. Um, here's the first attack where the Hessians managed to catch up with those units who were trying to get back across the river. Um, it did not result in a, a kill. It was a pin, but it certainly did uh, make the American player sweat because he those guns could only cross. Uh, well, those guns were on the wrong side of the river. Uh, th that rifle unit was really good, and he didn't want to lose him. And uh, those uh, Hessian units were very large. You can see their huge attack power, attack strength. They're almost a full stacking, a full hexa stacking point on their own. Um, here is, here's the result of, uh, Gray's attempted crossing. So, uh, most of his units were driven back. You can see one, two, three units disrupted Gray on top of one of them trying to rally them. The American artillery fire was extremely effective on this advance. Um, and really the only unit that was able to get across the river there on the top of that hill you can see is the 44th regiment. Uh, they actually managed to get, a, not only get across the river and up that hill, but they managed to push off the infantry unit that was, uh, protecting that artillery battery and force the artillery ba battery back one hex. Um, and so that that punched a hole uh, into that sort of defensive line. Um, unfortunately, the British were unable to capitalize um, without, other than that one unit because they had to uh, reform. And uh, here's a look at the morale for the American player. Uh, he was all the way down into the wavering uh, section at five there, pretty early into the game. I think this is turn five that we were at. Um, didn't hurt, didn't help that he lost one of his commanders early on. But you can see that some American reinforcements were coming in up the road to kind of try and take um, Grant in the rear as he was uh, gearing up to attack uh, Sterling across that creek there. And that would kind of play out later in the game as a bunch of back and forth uh, encounters. Now, here's where things got interesting. The 44th, who, as you know, took that hill, was immediately and very quickly surrounded by the Americans. Sullivan came over with a huge stack, and it really looked like he was going to... Um, be eliminated um, because he got across without any support from his uh, the rest of his force. Unfortunately, the American player rolled very poorly, and as you can see in this picture, managed to squirt out of there without taking a loss. He actually repulsed most of the units coming up that hill and got stuck behind enemy lines. You can see also over on the left the attack uh, about to take place with Grant uh, on some of those American units. And um, Gray, having finished up repositioning his artillery, finished up sort of uh, rallying his units. Um, and then you can see over on the far, far right uh, that the British managed with Knipphausen managed to sort of get across the creek, make a bridgehead over there. It would not last. They would be uh, viciously counterattacked by the Americans on that side of the river. And it actually would cost them some of their artillery pieces. Here's the Hessian line. They were just holding position. They weren't trying to get in the middle of all that uh, American artillery right there at that crossing. They really just wanted to anchor that flank so the Americans didn't get any uh, crazy ideas. A lot of these artillery sight lines were blocked by the forest, so it wasn't a huge deal. And then here is the main British line. Um, after Knipphausen got across, the Americans counterattack, forced them back. You can see Knipphausen forced him really far back and uh, left some of the British artillery uh, artillery units really exposed. Um, and what would happen here is that the Americans would mount a little sort of expedition across Brandywine and take those artillery pieces away from the British. At this point, this was a pretty huge blow for the British uh, because they had been kind of teetering back and forth. They couldn't quite drive the dagger home through the heart of the American player. He was sticking around, he was sticking around, and I was trying really hard to try and get across the creek somewhere to put some pressure on this line, which seemed like it was uncrackable at this point, especially after the uh, British player took two of the better guns, artillery pieces that the British had brought up uh, to bear on them. Uh, I guess the only bright side here is that one of these units ended up getting eliminated uh, pretty much immediately. I can't remember if it was Hartley on the right or the old 11th on the left, but basically they paid uh, for coming across that way. And then finally, here's, uh, here's where things got real interesting. Um, sort of the last big British reinforcement stack for the game comes in in the far upper left of the board on the other side of Brandywine. This is Howe's main army, along with a, a huge number of German uh, units, uh, Cornwallis, uh, as well as, as the Vanguard. And I basically was trying to get them up the road as quickly as possible to snag this, the city that would be most of the victory points for the game, uh, which you can't see here off to your right. So this caused the uh, American player to have to really make a tough decision about where he was going to defend and how, with how much force he was going to defend, because up to this point it had been a pretty big stalemate. 
And here's a look at the board. You can see the Americans dug themselves out of their morale hole, but you can see that a, uh, a bunch of the uh, Americans under green peeled off from the line along the creek and are heading back towards uh, the town there uh, where a, an advanced British cavalry scout had uh, captured it briefly, momentarily, uh, as Howe's army was coming up. Up the, up the map. You can also see here that uh, the attack down on the flank, on the left flank by Grant, uh, was repulsed by, uh, by uh, Sterling. And then with the Americans coming up behind with some cavalry and some Hessians diverting from Howe's army to kind of um, lend some support, it would become real messy over there on that part of Brandywine Creek. Ultimately, didn't really have an effect on the battle. Here's Green's column arriving in the town, um, and they would have they would essentially force that cavalry, that British cavalry unit, to withdraw, uh, and they would set up a defensive perimeter there. Um, and then here is where we started to get into the end game, um, where uh, again Knipphausen. Uh, so first, yeah, Knipphausen took a, a big stack of uh, units of British units and loyalist units, and he wanted to push across the ferry there, and he successfully did so. He rolled uh, amazingly well. He managed to drive off the uh, defense that the Americans had left. Now at this point, Green's withdrawal to the town had left sort of a chink in the armor, and Knipphausen was happy to take advantage of it. Um, he got his bridgehead there across that ferry. And what you're not seeing here is that George Washington himself uh, is in one of the stacks to Knipphausen's left. Um, and so now that that bridge had been established, the British player, me, was going to drive as many units across as, he, as I possibly could um, to just open up to open up that gap there and uh, really, you know, sort of segment out the American line. Here's a look. Um, I think we're, well, we're pretty far in the game at this point. Um, you can see that uh, Grant is, you know, Grant's taken some attacks from the Americans. He doesn't really have any spots to go. He's kind of caught in a no man's land. The Hessians from the rear of Howe's column have, have peeled off and they're trying to come up and support him. That was just kind of a preventative measure to make the American player um you know, not be able to concentrate his force. You can see that Gray, having finally rallied his units, is attempting another crossing with the uh, 55th there, who successfully get across. He's got some Germans, the combined uh, regiment there, and Donop, who are crossing at a ferry further up the river. And the Americans at this point in this particular part of the map uh, in had to sort of give up their line a little bit because of the 44th, who you can see made his way way further inland all the way at the top, managed to sneak around through the enemy units and uh, actually join up on the road where Howe's army was marching through uh, miraculously. He wasn't killed, but the American effort to track him down obviously depleted their defense there and it allowed Gray an opportunity to get across, even though there are still many American batteries firing down on them. Uh, but ultimately, what would sink the battle for the Americans here is that uh, George Washington, as he saw Niphausen setting up across the river, felt that he needed to drive him back, otherwise all was lost. So Washington himself led a brave attack, uh, a, a combined attack of a multitude of different American uh, continental units, um, and he came racing down this road, and then he rolled for the attack. And it did not go well. There was a leader casualty involved, and um, that leader casualty was Mr. Washington himself. And that, uh, at that particular point, uh, put a nail in the coffin to the American effort to defend Brandywine. And in fact, probably put a nail in the coffin of the American Revolution as the commander-in-chief went down under a hail of British musket fire. Uh, pretty dramatic ending, a pretty hilarious ending. The um, the odds in this attack, I think, were two to one or three to one, and uh, it just did not go well for, for uh, Washington's troops there. Knipphausen putting up a, a stiff defense and the British coming away the better of it. Here's a look um, at the sort of, we, we, the, the, the American player basically called it at that point with Washington dead. He was down to two morale. Um, he was about to lose the town there in the north. Um, you know, Gray was crossing the river. There weren't a lot of bright spots for uh, the American player at this point, especially with all these morale penalties he was taking. So it was only a matter of time. I believe we got to turn uh, eight. We got to turn eight, and uh, and we called it in a a British victory. Here's a state uh, a look at the state of things at the end. You can see that uh, the American line somewhat more bedraggled than it was at the start of the game. Lots of units up there that you can see destroyed or captured, really on both sides, but uh, definitely in the uh, eliminated box. Um, a, a lot more Americans than British. I think they only lost a single cavalry unit, um, two casualties. 
so there you go. That was uh, Brandywine, uh, Battle of the American Revolution um, scenario in the Tri-Pack. Uh, we love this system. He loved it for his first play. I love this system. This has been uh, just a fantastic experience playing through all of these games finally, um, solo or head-to-head. We had a ton of fun. He actually enjoyed it so much that we've uh, done a standing um, Battles of the American Revolution uh, game day uh, every couple of Saturdays. So last weekend we played... Um, we played Utah Springs, which you've seen on this channel. That was fun face to face. Unfolded completely differently uh, than when than my video on it, and uh, it ended up being. Um, a, an American uh, victory, or a, a, no, it ended up being a British victory, even though they ended up not rolling well at all. They took a bunch of casualties, and they were they were only won uh, by hanging on to one of the camp hexes at the end of the game. So that was pretty fun. And then we also played uh, Savannah, which is the siege game in the series. I actually can play three players. We played that three players head to head. That was a blast. Savannah is awesome. GMT really needs to reprint that game. I think at this point it is the one game in this series that has been out of print the longest. Um, it uses event cards. Um, it's got some really cool uh, rules around sieges. Um, the weather in our particular game played a huge role. The French and the Americans could not get their siege set up uh, in a reasonable amount of time, and the British cakewalked it. Um, but it was a ton of fun um and that's one that i think has a lot of replayability that i think we're going to play again at some point if we do i'll try and document it as well um otherwise let me know what you think of this format uh you know it, it was what i had and what i was able to do a video on so uh hopefully this was at least interesting to you here's some of the final pictures as you're as you're seeing on the screen the final shots of uh you know, the final position of some of these units and uh, what was about to happen had George Washington not died. So, uh, anywho, thank you for watching this and uh, stay tuned for some more content on the channel shortly.